is the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. Hey, gentlemen, welcome back to the Electile Dysfunction Podcast with Ashton Cohen. I'm Ashton Cohen. I'm joined today by Sean McMeekin. Sean's a historian and professor at Bard College and the author of an incredible book, one of the most interesting history books, honestly, I've ever read, which is why I'm so eager to have him on. It's called Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Professor McMeekin, thank you so much for being on with me today. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Ashton. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're gonna, I want to talk about your view on, on World War II and Stalin's role in it and how we should be thinking about it. But first, you know, we scheduled this about six, eight weeks ago, and here we are 70 years after the death of Stalin, 30 years after Soviet Union collapse, and Russia's in the news again, looking, uh, you know, encroaching on other countries, taking over other countries. Uh, there's a situation with Russia and its, um, you know, attempted maybe invasion or annexation of certain parts of Ukraine. You're obviously an expert on modern Russian history. And I was having this conversation with my dad the other day. My dad's obviously somebody who's you know, well knowledgeable about history and politics. But he asked me, he's like, I don't get it. Why? What does Russia still want with Ukraine? I mean, it's the biggest country in the world as it is. Uh, what's this fascination with Ukraine? Why are they willing to sort of draw the ire of the entire world once again to get into a country like Ukraine. What's your perspective on Russia's current situation right now with respect to its encroachment on Ukrainian land? Well, Russia and Ukraine, I mean, it's a huge subject. It's obviously uh, vastly contentious, goes back into the into the deepest origins of Russian history. I mean, even to some extent, creation myths. Uh, there's a case to be made that Kiev and Rus uh, was kind of the Ur Russian state or the original Russian state. And Kiev is, of course, older than Moscow, as, as many Ukrainians are fond of pointing out. Uh, however, that state, of course, went under and uh, ceased to exist for, for many centuries and was then eventually reabsorbed, really from the 17th century on, bits and pieces of it, not the entire thing. Um, but from the Russian perspective, um, the Novorossiya or New Russia, many of the lands that are now contested in eastern Ukraine, along with Crimea, uh, were absorbed in the era of Catherine the Great. Um, so in American terms, that's actually pretty old. You know, if you're talking about going back to the war against the Ottoman Empire between 1768-1774, the final annexation of Crimea in yeah. 1783. From, so from the Russian perspective, certainly that of a kind of a Russian nationalist or patriot like Putin, Ukraine is an integral part of Russia and has been at least since the 18th century, if not, again, if you want to go back even further into kind of the mists of time, some fundamental part of, of Russia in its, in its identity. Um, Ukrainians obviously view this a little bit differently, uh, both um, in terms of a kind of ethnic identity, um, their differences of religious faith between the Orthodox Church and the Unionate Church, um, parts of what is now Ukraine were also part of the Habsburg Empire, and so they obviously don't, mm -hmm. the people from, from that part don't really view themselves as Russian at all, but of course in, in the eastern parts of Ukraine, the cultures are far more closely intertwined, the language is very close, uh, there's a, a shared history, a lot of blood has been shed. Uh, the entire history, what we in the West call the Crimean War, usually just called by the Russians, the, the Vostochna Vaina, or Eastern War. Uh, a lot of it was, of course, fought in and over the Crimea. Um, so that for a lot of Russians, again, Crimea is this, not just a kind of a, a fundamental part of, of Russian territory, but blood has been shed there on behalf of Mother yeah. Russia. So it's hugely important, symbolically important. We haven't even gotten to 20th century history, which I suppose is what we ultimately <laughs> want to talk about, but where right. you have both a, a kind of briefly independent Ukraine and then Ukraine being reabsorbed in the course of the Russian Civil War, a lot of blood being shed then, um, uh, horrendous losses in the, the famine of the early 1930s, which Ukrainians like to call now the Holodomor, and they obviously blame on, on Stalin, but also on I suppose Russia, the Soviet Union, seen as almost kind of a Russian imperial state by some Ukrainians. Um, contested history, uh, uh, the Second World War, um, uh, guerrilla warfare after the Second War. It, it goes on and on. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. deeply contentious and, and fraught and difficult history, I think, uh, for both Russians and Ukrainians. And, and it's one that I think we in the West probably can only kind of grasp the surface of. And, and and quickly from like someone like Putin's perspective, what does Ukraine bring to Russia? What what's what's the advantage there? Is it uh, resources? Is it easier navigation to Europe? What exactly would be the, the sort of what do you think the main reasons would be that Ukraine is valuable other than you know the shared history? Oh well, I mean there are all kinds of things. If you talk about strategic geography, obviously kind of land bridge to Europe. You also have the Black Sea, Russia, and her famous lust or lack of warm water ports that is lust for warm water ports or lack of warm water ports although now 
Crimea is effectively being, of course, administered by Russia, and there is a there is a literal bridge to Crimea. There isn't the land bridge is still, of course, controlled by Ukraine, and so you have access to world markets. I mean, in the late days of the Tsars, this meant uh, grain and wheat exports and the imports of industrial inputs and equipment. Um, I mean, these days a lot of it, of course, has to do with oil and energy resources and pipelines. And one of the big reasons they're talking about Nord Stream one and two up in the Baltic is that that allows Russia potentially to bypass Ukraine. But of course. Ukraine has traditionally served as a conduit for Russian energy exports population, even if Ukraine's population is kind of declining these days, it's still a, a robust country uh, at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, close on 50 million people. So you, right. you lose 50 million people, you've lost a lot. I mean, the, uh, my old mentor, Norman Stone, had a great phrase about, about Ukraine and Russia. He said that with Ukraine, Russia was the United States. She was a superpower. Without Ukraine, uh, she's Canada, mostly snow. And that's perhaps an exaggeration. Obviously, Russia has a larger population, more resources, nuclear weapons, etc. It's a, a much more powerful country than Canada. But that said, you see why you lose 50 million people. There was, of course, uh, negotiations over the parts of the nuclear arsenal that were in Ukraine. You have naval bases, a place like Sevastopol. You have hugely important cities, port cities like Odessa. Um, and obviously, the industrial base, uh, the Donbass region, resources, everything from, from coal, of course, to, to iron, uh, a lot of heavy industry. Um, it's obviously a, a hugely important part of what had been the Soviet economy and, and was somewhat disrupted, of course, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and ever since, there's mm -hmm. been this kind of ongoing tug of war over whether Ukraine will be reintegrated into Russia and the Russian sphere and economy or whether Ukraine will try to join the West. And this, this tug of war obviously has been playing out in ever more violent and dramatic uh, fashion over the past eight or nine years, especially over the past weeks. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And a lot of the themes you hit on right now go back to the centerpiece of your book in World War II for a lot of sort of Stalin's ex expansionists, um, expeditions and taking over of other countries and the reasons for that. So going back to sort of the subject of your book, World War II, um, from the American perspective, we see it. You know, it's all about Hitler, essentially, right? It's Hitler and the Japanese. It's about the U.S.'s response to Hitler and Japanese, you know, maybe England's response. You have you – know, Stalin's not really center stage. He's our buddy. He's not the prime antagonist. He's not the prime protagonist, obviously. He's more of a supporting actor. And, you know, the leads are FDR. It's Churchill. It's people like uh, – after that, maybe it's people like Patton and Eisenhower. We don't talk too much about Stalin. We don't really consider – the Soviet Union's role as much, uh, and occasionally we, we may mention Mussolini. But make the case for us how Stalin is the central figure of World War II. Everything revolves around him. Is that right? And and is our framing of it from 1939 to 1945, is that a misnomer in itself? Should we be thinking about that paradigm differently? Well, in general, yes, I do think we should think about it more broadly and differently. I obviously wouldn't want to say that absolutely everything that happened everywhere in the world revolved around Stalin and his, mm -hmm. his foreign policy for elections and needs. I suppose uh, when you write a book like this, a revisionist book, which is trying to change the existing narrative, um, a lot of what I am doing is challenging those assumptions about the driving forces and factors in the war. I mean, to begin with, for example, uh, you have almost the what I sometimes call the kind of a Tom Hanks version of the war. Uh, I'm not just talking about movies like um uh movies like uh, Private ryan, Private ryan uh, and mm -hmm. some of the documentaries but even if you go to the world war ii museum in, in, in new orleans you've got sort of tom hanks there giving the official version of the war against fascism and of course you've got italy and japan and germany and they're somehow kind of lumped together as on the one hand fascist on the other hand revisionist meaning they wanted to revise borders territories they were obviously aggressors and uh trying to re-alter the kind of geopolitical landscape in, in their favor um, and there's obviously some truth to this. I mean, you can say that you know, Mussolini was probably the, the least threatening of the three. They all had different ways in which they were trying to revise the existing order and ways in which they kind of opposed the, the domination or the dominion of what they often call the Anglo-Saxon world, meaning Britain and the United States and their kind of world system. The thing that I think always gets left out um, and misunderstood um, as far as both the origins of the war, but also understanding Soviet foreign policy in particular, is that, is that Stalin was a revisionist. A uh, revisionist statesman as well. That is to say, when we're talking about Ukraine today, uh, a large part of what Putin, of course, is trying to do is you talk about revising borders, you talk about aggression. Of course, from the Russian perspective, they're trying to 
to some extent, restore or recapture an older version of their own empire. So that when Stalin was looking at the map in the 1930s, he saw territories which had been lost, which had once been Russian or Soviet. Uh, Finland, for example, over which they had fought in the First World War, the, the three Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, uh, which had been lost in the course of the Russian Revolution and Civil War. Uh, Poland, much of which, of course, had been uh, part of Congress Poland, as it used to be called, part of Tsarist Russia, with which the Soviet Union had fought a war over territory in 1920, so that Poland was kind of seen as an almost visceral or hereditary enemy, and the Soviets didn't really recognize the border with Poland. Um, Ukraine, of course, those borders had been fluid. The Soviets had fought to recapture lots of Ukraine, but they had also lost parts of Ukraine uh, to Poland in particular. Um, the Soviets also had designs in Romanian territory down on the littoral of the Black Sea, again, some of which had been fought over multiple times in wars going back centuries, particularly with the Ottoman Empire, over the Danube Delta, and some of the, the kind of critical uh, areas um, abutting the Black Sea. So that Stalin had revisionist territorial objection. There was also, of course, the broader vision, and this is the part that I also emphasize in, in the early cha uh, chapters of the book where I'm trying to set up the frame, which is, of course, world communism. That, uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, most of the histories of the war treat Stalin as if between 1941 and 45, he kind of ceased being a communist. They supposedly abolished the Communist International in 1943, and so really he just became a more traditional Russian statesman, a plucky ally, or Uncle Joe, as they try to call him in American propaganda. Right. Whereas, in fact, all along, you had world communism. The, the essential goal of Soviet mm -hmm. foreign policy is to expand the boundaries of communism. Um, so that from his perspective, in fact, a war in Europe was a great thing. It wasn't a tragedy. It was a war mm -hmm. between the capitalist and imperialist powers. Uh, he obviously wanted to enter it on his own terms in his own way, but he both saw that war as inevitable based on his reading of history in Marxist-Leninist terms, but also as kind of an opportunistic thing the Soviets could exploit. Um, so that, again, not alone, obviously, he, to some extent, helped cook it up together with Hitler, particularly with their right. uh, summit with, with uh, Ribbentrop and Molotov and the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Moscow Pact mm -hmm. of uh, August 23rd, 1939. Uh, but the, the, part, the, the part I men mention is, again, the traditional story is just, well, Hitler, you know, was going to start a war and he needed reassurance from, you know, on his Eastern Front to avoid the, the specter of, of a massive great power two-front war. And obviously that's part of the story, but what I think is generally neglected is that the partition of Poland was not a German or, or a Hitlerian idea. It was actually a Soviet idea. It was a Soviet proposal. Yeah. It was actually the Soviet okay. idea all along. Uh, the Soviets so were the ones... It started in World War II, right. Um, and this, you can actually see it beginning in kind of theoretical journals and back-channel conversations going back to 1938. Um, um so you know, there are a lot of reasons we can kind of talk about mm -hmm. them as we go. But one of the things I think everyone gets wrong, again, is seeing the Soviets as kind of this you know, secondary partner. Somehow Britain and France failed to trust Stalin, and therefore they couldn't come up with an agreement against Hitler rather right. than seeing Stalin's foreign policy as its own dynamic catalyst. That, in fact, uh, the Soviets and the Germans had been collaborating uh, secretly, both with military co collaboration with certain interruptions in the 1930s after the Nazis came to power. But then again, beginning in 38, 39, they're deepening this relationship. In fact, from mm -hmm. Stalin's perspective, the Germans had more to give him than France and Britain did, and he, he never trusted France or Britain or the capitalist powers. You know, he saw them as his ultimate adversaries. So let's let's take it from there. So Stalin, prior to Germans' invasion of Poland, which, as you mentioned, was Stalin's idea to, to begin with, and the partition was was his idea, that the Soviets would take, I, they end up with a bigger chunk, right? And, this, and the Nazis would take a, a, the other part of Poland. Um, so Stalin was working quite closely. The relations between the Nazis and Soviets leading up to World War II were were very close. They had their uh, Molotov um, and and his uh, was it Ribbentrop, right? Were work, were yeah. were exchanging communications quite frequently. They had a lot of common interests. They were um, working together on a lot of different areas in terms of sharing of resources and things of that nature, and. England and France and the United States never really saw the Soviets as being quite the enemy that Hitler and the Nazis posed to the rest of Europe. How, well, well, that's right. Why France, yeah. Yeah. Well, France did have a so-called mutual assistance pact with the Soviet Union, which dated to 1935. It had never actually blossomed into full military cooperation. The Soviets wouldn't really even let mm -hmm. French military attaches and generals uh, inspect their inspect their troops or inspect their technology it was 
you know, really kind of wishful thinking, I think, on the part of France, and the Soviets never really honored it. Um, when it came to, to Britain, uh, I mean, Churchill's an interesting case, although he's out of power for most of the 30s. He doesn't come into the cabinet until after the Germans do invade Poland, follow, of course, in short order by the Soviets in September 1939. Um, but Churchill still kind of saw the Soviets, despite his generally anti-communist worldview, that is, he was ostensibly conservative, but he also saw Russia, in more traditional terms, as as Britain's ally in the First World War. And so mm -hmm. he didn't see Soviet or Russian revisionism in the same way that he saw German revisionism. That, that is to say, in fact, even after the Soviets invaded Poland, Churchill takes the position that this was actually a good thing because the Soviets mm -hmm. could be a counterweight to Germany. I mean, maybe it becomes a little wow. bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that this is how Churchill views the Soviet Union, whereas, of course, they're viewed quite differently by their neighbors. The Baltic states, Finland and Romania, all of which are invaded by the Soviets between 1939 right. and 1941, along with Poland, of course, kind of the granddaddy of them all. And obviously the Poles, much as they had good reason to fear the Germans, and in many ways, in fact, Poland had been closer to Germany before 1939, seeing the Soviets as really their, their primary enemy or threat. I think it's just probably because of the distance that Britain, France, and the United States, they obviously did not share the same kind of almost terror or concern about Soviet expansion as many of these countries in Eastern Europe did. And and in that sense, right, the Germans and the Soviets were really kind of ideal partners, at least geopolitically um, at the time, and that they could uh, revise the map together and just carve up Eastern Europe together. And that's exactly what they agreed to do. And then they did. Uh, eventually, friction develops, perhaps inevitably, right. over the spoils. But it, it, at the time, it actually uh, served the interests of both uh, Stalin and Hitler to, to cooperate. So by, by 39, you mentioned... Hitler had invaded and taken over seven countries, and Stalin had invaded and taken over seven countries. And so well, not they're both. Yeah. Before it into 1940, yep. 41, but yes. R yeah. Right. Okay. So they're both seeming to be like equal forces in terms of destabilizing Europe and causing all this travesty. Uh, you know, Hitler, Stalin was responsible for genocide in Ukraine. Hitler was obviously undergoing the Holocaust uh, into the 40s. And there's there's opprobrium for Hitler and not so much Stalin. Stalin has still seen somebody that maybe the West can potentially work with. Was there any was there ever any question about that? Yeah, it's just uh, you know as a historian, I hate to be a stickler, but you really have to be careful about dates. You know, so if you're in right. 1940, for example, the Holocaust hasn't really happened yet. Yes, you do mm -hmm. have the Nuremberg Laws, Kristallnacht, book burnings. I mean, the Nazis have obviously already committed all, all manner of crimes, war crimes in Poland. Right. Obviously, they've also had kind of extrajudicial like, executions. A lot of Jews have been rounded up. Obviously, synagogues torched. All kinds of bad things had happened. But that said, the Holocaust, as we know it today, hadn't actually happened yet. And uh, in fact. While in the winter of 3940, that is to say from the time that Poland is kind of crushed and erased from the map in September 1939, and the time the Germans begin their moves uh, first into kind of um, uh, Denmark and in Norway, and then eventually France and the Low Countries in the spring of 1940, uh, the, the so-called phony war, as we call it in English, or the droll de guerre, or the Sitzkrieg, as the Germans call it, the kind of sitting on your butt war, uh, the Germans actually for a time did not seem necessarily as as uniquely exclusionarily threatening um, as, as the Soviets did. When the Soviets invaded Finland, in fact, a lot of uh, the Western world teamed up to denounce it. Uh, the League of the Soviets were actually expelled from the League of Nations. Everyone forgets this. The, right. the League secretary possibly observes, well, Germany, Italy, and Japan at least had the decency to resign from the League before they committed acts mm -hmm. of armed aggression. You know, the Soviets were even, even denounced by Roosevelt, who had been fairly friendly to the Soviets in opening up relations, uh, quite categorically denounced for the aggression in Finland. And there was a time in spring 1940 when, when Britain and France came very close to going to war with the Soviet Union. The Stalin, however, because of his superlative intelligence network, kind of rooted out this plot and cut the legs out from under their plans, basically by suing for early peace with Finland. And he also ordered what we now call the Katyn massacre of, of the Polish officers and elites, which is sort of this preemptive strike against a possible fifth column in case uh, the Western powers invaded the Soviet Union. So there was a time, that is, that they did begin to see Stalin as perhaps not as directly threatening. I mean, the Soviets obviously were not threatening to invade France and the Low Countries like Hitler was, but that is to say, as an aggressor who was also disturbing uh, world order and, and the peace. Um, it's just that this was all kind of conveniently forgotten after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, and uh -huh. it served the interest of, you might call it, allied diplomacy to kind of whitewash all of this and whitewash Stalin's crimes and, and turn him into a plucky ally and Uncle Joe and all the rest. So one of the things people always wonder about is how several countries around the world and in Europe in particular were willing to side with Hitler. Would you say that their calculus was that 
under Hitler, they had a better chance of survival than under Stalin? Was that the choice some countries, some of those countries faced? Oh, if you're talking about countries like Slovakia, Hungary, for example, Bulgaria, right. which to some extent teams up with Hitler, even though they never declare war in the Soviet Union, uh, Romania, uh, Finland, which both actually, of course, uh, along with Hungary and Slovakia, actually kind of officially join what we call Operation Barbarossa. There are other countries such as mm-hmm. Mussolini's Italy and Franco Spain, which uh, were not necessarily they weren't necessarily full-on belligerents in Soviet Russia, but where they kind of contributed divisions. I suppose Mussolini was closer to a full-on ally. Franco kept his distance, but allowed a kind of volunteer division to form. Um, you're talking about some of the, I guess Italy, we already assume was part of the Axis. You're talking about some of these other countries. Right. Well, sure. I mean, they saw the Germans, as, obviously in 1940, Nazi Germany also looked like a winner. Um and in the case of, let's say, Romania and Finland, uh, they had just been invaded by the Soviet Union. So to some extent, they're also trying to recapture lost territory. And okay. and yes, they, they also didn't see the Germans. Uh, in the case of Romania, they also lost a lot. I mean, Romania had to forfeit territory to some of her neighbors, um, including Bulgaria and, uh, uh, and Hungary. Um, Yugoslavia was a much more difficult case where, of course, eventually the Germans actually have to mount a kind of hostile invasion where they don't. They don't well. They, briefly, they sign an agreement, and there was a coup d'état supported by the Western powers. So every country's case is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is important to remember that again, the world of 1940 is very different from the world of 1944 or 45. No one knew how the war would turn out, uh, nor did people know about what we now know about the Holocaust yet. Before, right. Basically, because it hadn't happened yet, but also because while there were obviously certain hints of kind of what might be coming in in terms of Nazi race policy and and discrimination and treatment of uh, civilians and war prisoners in Poland. A lot of countries still saw Stalin as, uh, at the time, again, as as at least as guilty of crimes against human rights Mm -hmm. and and ethnic persecution and and deportations. And in fact, the Soviet system is effectively more threatening because, of course, it meant, among other things, that when the Soviets moved into countries, you know, they looted the banks, they nationalized all the properties, they completely overturned the private economy, whereas the Nazis would milk countries. Yes, I mean, they wouldn't treat them generously. They would milk them for resources, but they wouldn't utterly destroy the private economy, you know, so that if you're a country like Romania, it's a pretty easy choice. You know, you'd rather be in the German sphere than the Soviet one. Um, it's just that in the end, obviously, you could say it was the wrong choice strategically because they backed the wrong side in the war. Mm-hmm. Real quickly as well, I, I wanted to, because you mentioned this in the book, I, history I never knew about. So you talk about the Katyn massacre in uh, that Stalin was responsible for with, with the Polish armed, um, essentially about the Polish elite and, and people of a certain class. And many of those people after the Katyn massacre as well, because he, he then sent, what, another 60,000, 70,000 people from Poland who had escaped the German-occupied part who were Jews to the Gulag. Can you sort of go over that, that history as well? Because some of the history, I've, we also hear about Stalin and the Soviets, is that, oh, you know, they liberated the concentration camps and, you know, things like the Ukrainian genocide. And you also mentioned, like, a genocide in Kazakhstan as well. Barely ever talked about. I didn't even know about the genocide in Kazakhstan. Can you sort of go over some of those, the war crime elements that were white, whitewashed away from Stalin, as well as the sending away of many of the Polish Jews who are escaping Hitler to their demise as well? Well, right. I mean, look, um, there are a lot of different episodes, and some of them are more or less contentious. Katyn, interestingly, the Katyn Forest Massacre, Russia actually did accept responsibility for this, finally owning up to it in, I believe, 1993, but that was in kind of the early years after the fall of the Soviet Union, when Russia was fairly weak. Now, you're going to see books again in Russia, which are beginning to assert that there's more ambiguity or even overtly denying responsibility for the crime. I mean, this this was, we have, you know, we basically have the smoking gun as far as the orders of Bulgaria directing the NKVD. They have all kinds of lists of categories of types of Poles who were in these essentially forced labor camps who were all being rounded up. They have specific target numbers, you know, this kind of a death quota. It's an explicit death sentence. Um, you know, in the end, the figure slightly under 23,000 were murdered in cold blood. Not in the Katyn Forest. That's a slightly confusing part. Most of them were actually mm-hmm. killed in these kind of basements and cellars and in cities and uh, what is now Ukraine and Poland, but then a lot of the bodies were dumped in the Katyn Forest, and that's where they were discovered actually by, by the Germans in 1943, uh, which allowed the Soviets to claim, you know, that the, the, the Nazis had fabricated the crime and it was actually a German crime, not a Soviet one. That was actually the official position of the U.S. government until 1951, uh, again, hmm. partly for reasons of allied diplomacy. They just whitewashed the whole thing. They didn't want to embarrass their uh, their wartime ally. 
uh, despite the fact of nearly all of the evidence. I mean, to begin with, the Germans invited in the Red Cross, and the Soviets didn't want to hear about it. And the Soviets denounced the Red Cross as sort of these lack lackeys of cannibal Hitler and all the rest of it. So, the, you know, that was maybe the most egregious and to some extent most notorious. It was a big Cold War uh, kind of a calling card where in, in, in Poland, uh, of course, Sovietized Poland, uh, simply mm -hmm. uh, stating the year 1940 instead of 1941 was kind of a, an act of political protest against the communist regime. Um, we're talking about earlier crimes uh, in Ukraine. Obviously, there, there's a debate about kind of intentionality. Uh, we know about people also debate the numbers. You know, are you talking about two or three million? Are you talking about as many as 10 million? Uh, the wow. Ukrainian government would, would side with a higher estimate for the number of, of victims. You know, was it deliberate starvation? You know, was it more kind of the, you know, the accidental byproduct of this murderous collectivization uh, policy where we know that they hoarded the grain, you know, they sh closed down private farms and, and killed and deported the so-called kulaks. You know, we have a, a pretty good outline of the basic story, but there's obviously still... Right, of the Soviets, yep. Uh, about, you know, was Stalin targeting Ukrainians ethnically as a people? You know, that's obviously mm -hmm. something which is hard to prove and people are, argue the point. You know, was it a kind of an ethnic... Uh, genocide, or was it you know, more of a kind of just a byproduct of communist policies, which often produce famines in, in countries? Right. Uh, why not? Obviously, you know, there it's maybe not ethnic, but it's obviously a kind of a type of mass murder all the same with Mao's great move mm -hmm. forward. Kazakhstan, again, much of the story was relatively unknown, and still the documents started coming out in the 90s. Estimates there, perhaps one and a half, perhaps two million. They obviously disrupted the whole nomadic way of life with the forced collectivization program. You know, casualties in the industrialization wars, the gulag forced labor camps. We know that when they went into Poland in 1939, there were hundreds of thousands of people dispute the, the exact number. Um, you talk about Jews. I mean, that, that was an interesting and perhaps slightly anomalous case. In general, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the Jews were welcomed into the Soviet zone. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Germans at that stage in 1939, you might say, were either kind of happy to get rid of them or didn't mind looking the other way as they fled into the Soviet zone. Uh, obviously, the Jews who were in the German hands uh, ultimately faced a, a terrible fate in Poland, right. death camps and later on the extermination camps. Um, the ones who, who made it to the Soviet Union, a lot of them were actually welcomed at first. It's just that later on, a lot of them themselves ended up in labor camps. And some of it was because, again, there was a great irony here. It was kind of a parallel crime to the Katyn Forest Massacre in the spring of 1940, uh, that many of them, despite, of course, being Jewish, were also quite patriotically Polish. And so okay. they actually re refused to renounce their citizenship. And because of that, they were then later targeted because they they hadn't forfeited their Polish citizenship for, for kind of extra deportation. Um, wow. So again, they weren't necessarily targeted by Stalin right. because they were Jews. There was a later right. period in Soviet history where Stalin did mm -hmm. become quite paranoid, the so-called doctor's plot period where they're talking about cosmopolitanism. They're definitely targeting Jews later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, you know, a lot of them were, were victimized just as many we might call them Gentiles, were in Poland uh, by yep. the vast occupation uh, campaign. And you know, obviously they were horrendously mistreated and you know, sent to forced labor camps where rations were poor and many of them either starved to death or died right. of disease. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily exterminated in, in the deliberate mm -hmm. literal sense, let's say the German death camps. Um, right. Although those, obviously the 20, 23,000 odd, it's like less than 23,000 Polish officers and elites were, uh, they were quite deliberate. There were also collaborators targeted in the early days after the German invasion, the various orders for deportation, treatment of uh, Soviet prisoners of war who had been captured by the enemy, you know, we know about that, mm -hmm. Article 2, 270. Um, uh, treatment also just captured German and other, okay, German allies. We normally call allies the, the Western allies, but of course the Germans had allies when they invaded the Soviet Union, Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, Romania, Finland, Slovakia, Italy, and then not explicitly Spain, but a lot of Spanish volunteers, so even some from France. Um, and a lot of those were, those people were horrendously treated by the Soviets um, when they were captured. Uh, again, it's one, one of the, the facts, it's a little bit, for whatever reason, people don't like you to mention this, but it is actually a fact that Germany, including Nazi Germany, was a signatory to the Geneva and Hague Conventions on the Treatment of Prisoners of War. They obviously abused it. That is, they honored them in wow. the breach okay. in many cases, but they were signatories. The Soviet Union was not. The Soviet Union had explicitly mm. repudiated uh, the Hague and Geneva Conventions. They did not actually recognize prisoners of war as any kind of legal category. Uh, you know, so, and, and the Germans tried, you know, perhaps disingenuously, but in the early days of the war, they tried to exchange prisoner lists so that their own people would be better treated by the Soviets. The Germans had to break through the coals for their own treatment of Soviet prisoners of war. And it was brutal. I mean, we now see that the casualty mm -hmm. figures, you know, perhaps more than 50% died in captivity. Um, it, was, it was horrendous. Another German war crime, which has been investigated in recent years. But 
few people talk about the Soviet treatment of prisoners of war and the fact that the Soviets refused uh, to allow the, the Red Cross or anyone to inspect their own prisoner of war camps. Um, you know, a large part of the reason we know so much about German war crimes in comparison to Soviet ones is that the Germans were defeated in 1945. So everything was kind of an open book. You know, you have right. the Allies, the trials, to some extent, victor's justice, but also, obviously, there was a lot of genuine research into actual war crimes. Uh, documents were published so that we have kind of the smoking guns proving complicity and guilt for various crimes against humanity. Whereas the Soviets weren't defeated in 1945, so they got to keep their secrets, uh, a few of which started to come out after 1991, but by no means all of them. Walk us through how the Soviets went from convenient allies of Nazi Germany to eventually being invaded by the Nazis to eventually being on our side. What, what was the sort of the timeline there? And what were the major events that well, led up to that? I mean, the usual view is that Hitler had planned this all along, and you go back to Mein Kampf and the talk of Lebensraum in the East and kind of visions of, of Ukraine in the steppe. Um, you know, obviously, it had always been part of his thinking and to some extent part of German military planning, which, which definitely does begin to ramp up after the fall of France and the Low Countries in 1940. Um, but I don't think it was necessarily set in stone. It wasn't written. That is to say that the Germans were going to invade. Uh, the break really happens in, in the late months of 1940. Um, to some extent, they even argue about the, uh, about the term. You know, where, was the Molotov Ritten Pact, was it exhausted? You know, was it fulfilled? That is to say, what was left to do? They had already more or less, they were haggling over things like the exact Soviet position in Romania, and there were border disputes with Romania. The Germans desperately needed the oil from Plushti, uh, the refineries outside Bucharest to Plushti. They needed Romanian oil. They also needed the Soviet oil. Stalin, to mm. some extent, had Hitler over barrel economically. Um, you know, he had Hitler relied very, very heavily on Soviet resources, but also particularly Romanian oil. The Soviets were making these kind of increasingly uh, aggressive demands regarding Germans withdrawing from Romania. They wanted the Germans to withdraw from Finland, where they had. Uh, personnel and engineers on the ground, they needed nickel. Uh, this is for their panzers, the tanks, among other things, from, from Finland. Uh, chrome, which is hugely important for strengthening uh, the resistance to steel and the production of tanks in particular, but really all motorized vehicles, um, along with airplanes. And the chrome the Germans were getting almost exclusively through the Balkans. Uh, okay. Turkey was a major source, but also the Balkans themselves. They came through the Balkans and eventually had to transit, in many cases, Soviet-controlled territory. And so the Soviets are sort of putting the squeeze on and the Germans are trying to figure out if they could fit Stalin into this kind of view of the, the new European order that the Germans are trying to create. And mm -hmm. Stalin, in the end, he, he more or less blackmails Hitler. He says, you know, I'm not going to join your... By then, they call it the Tripartite Pact, the so-called Axis powers. I mean, the, the Soviets are invited right. to join. Absolutely are. Um, and they're invited to state kind of their own imperialistic aims that hopefully won't clash with those of Italy, J Japan, and, and Germany. And, and Stalin mm -hmm. basically states that he wants the right to... He wants the Germans to evacuate their military personnel from Romania and Finland. Uh, he wants the right for the Soviets to send troops to Bulgaria and to garrison the Turkish Straits, basically the Bosporus outside Istanbul and the Dardanelles. Uh, there's also demand because of Japan. We haven't really talked about Japan yet. We also wanted German help in regaining uh, South Sakhalin. Um, and oh, Hitler saw this as sort of blackmail, um, you know, basically, right. particularly with Romania and Finland. I mean, Stalin was trying to kind of strangle the German economy. That's how he saw it. So, you know, mm. it reacts quite emotionally. I, one of the documents I found is actually in the Bulgarian archives, this uh, conversation he has with the Bulgarian minister of Berlin, Karlan Draganov, where he just explodes for three and a half hours. You can pretty much see in real time. He's kind of deciding this is, you know, I've had it. This is enough. I can't trust Stalin, you know, mm -hmm. the, the next move. I have to kind of push towards that invasion. Can I stop you for a second there? Uh, world Germany. Yeah. Just so the audience can follow along. So Stalin was actually invited to join the pact with the Nazis, the Italians, and the Japanese. And he drove a very hard bargain. And that sort of caused the, the division between them, the diversion, uh, which is very interesting. I never knew that. I never knew that Stalin was actually invited to be a part of that the Axis group. Right. No. No, he was. And Essentially, uh, his terms were, were too high for Hitler to meet. Um, if you actually look at the, the chatter after the meeting, the Germans mm -hmm. still had some hope that the Soviets would come to terms, whereas Molotov tells yes. Stalin, no, it's done, it's over. Um, you know, so the Soviets start preparing more for Germany as well. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the other things I, I try to investigate in the book is kind of the extent of Soviet military preparations, what they were expecting, what they were planning for. You know, obviously, in the end, they got... Uh, not necessarily shocked or surprised, but that is the Germans invaded before they were ready. I think that that's pretty clear. The Soviets mm -hmm. were definitely preparing for war with Germany. Do you think that Hitler was willing to live with a uh, Soviet 
communism being in Europe, that he was he w- he was going to be willing to live with that, or do you think that inevitably he would have had to have in- invaded s- the Soviet Union just because of his sort of uh, egotistical, maniacal views of like world domination? Do you think he would have been able to have had Stalin be that presence in Europe had he just you know, maybe stuck with his sort of sphere of influence? Well, I think there are all kinds of counterfactuals. I mean, you know, it's clear that Hitler was not an entirely stable personality. Yeah. I mean, he would often react very emotionally to things. He had this kind of hypochondriac side, you know, thinking he was dying and he needed to achieve his vision before he died. You know, one, one could see him obviously reacting viscerally to any number of possible provocations. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. He obviously had this kind of ideological opposition to communism, but he was also ideologically opposed to capitalism. I mean, right. <laughs> uh, Brendan Sims, among other historians, has been investigating this side of things that, you know, that Hitler's kind of fundamental visceral opposition to the Anglo-Saxons and to kind of Anglo-dominated capitalism is, is mm-hmm. sometimes, I think, been underemphasized. But he would kind of veer between the extremes. Over the, over mm-hmm. the coming years, you know, you know, where the Soviets, you know, was at the real center of whatever you want to call world Jewry, you know, Soviet communism, mm-hmm. was actually, you know, the financial powers of the West with all of their kind of nefarious uh, imperialistic control and strangling the European economy by controlling the seas. I mean, I think he veered between extremes. I, I don't think yeah. anything was set in stone. I think it all depended on on rushing events and. You know, if Hitler had had his way, he would have signed some type of an agreement with Britain, I think, in 1939 or 1940, which, again, maybe would have just bought time for renewing the war at some later date. But, okay. uh, yeah. you know, it's not as if we were going his way. You know, he obviously hoped and wished that Britain would come to terms, and he didn't, right. you know, because right. Joe was obviously unwilling to countenance uh, a deal with Hitler. And, and yeah. you know, usually he celebrated for that. And, you know, I think I think that's great. He was obviously a man of principle. Um, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a difficult question, you know, had had Stalin, I actually think a more interesting question is had Stalin and Hitler met in person because by sending Molotov, who was not a particularly charming personality, he was dour, he was difficult. It was a, it was a really, really unpleasant encounter, I think, for, for, for Hitler and the Germans. You know, Molotov was, was not, not easy to deal with. Um, uh, Stalin was a tough negotiator, but I mean, he had more charm than Molotov did. And, and also, I think Hitler had some respect for him as a statesman, as a kind of fellow dictatorial right. tyrant yeah. <laughs> yeah i think had yeah. they actually met in person i think it's entirely possible they they would have developed a rapport in a relationship but yeah. of course that presumes stalin would have been willing to leave the soviet union or hitler would have been willing to leave germany i think mm-hmm. i think in, in that case i think was that actually possible yeah so you mentioned hitler uh, deviating between extremes he wasn't one for moderation uh, i think that's pretty clear the uh, uh one of the other interesting things you mentioned in your book so you you discuss how the soviets were so skilled, and we saw this later in the Cold War, they had infiltrated so many aspects of American and Western society. They had people in such high levels of positions of power. You mentioned even like they had Soviet agents in like every a- aviation firm, in every major aviation firm in the United States, including, you know, one of the, ma- the ones out here in LA. Hitler wasn't as successful as at doing that, I don't think, right? And so do you think that, first of all, wh- what do you, do you attribute that to anything Why the communists were so good at getting their assets into the West, whereas Nazis weren't as good, if that's true. And do you think that also played a role in the sh- in the perceptions of Stalin as being not as bad as Hitler because he had so many sympathizers in different positions of power in the West? Well, the Germans certainly did have some agents and some influence in the U.S. I mean, obviously there were allegations, for example, that Charles Lindbergh and the American First Movement were some sort of a font of German propaganda. I think that case is exaggerated. But the Germans did have, you know, the Bund, I mean, there were kind of these organizations that influenced public opinion in the United States. In the end, though, they didn't have any influence where it mattered, which is to say uh, the higher levels of government, particularly the Roosevelt administration. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, I think the Roosevelt administration recognized the Soviet Union Communist Party membership exploded uh, the period of the Popular Front in the mid-30s. You know, there were a lot of people who just sympathized with the Soviet cause, some of it because of propaganda manipulation. But it's just there was a huge pool of, you might call it, kind of almost talent to, to draw on. There were just so many either pro-Soviet or Soviet sympathizing people in Washington and also in mm-hmm. Hollywood, and you can see that during mm-hmm. the war as well. So the climate of opinion was increasingly pro-Soviet, and then after Stalin, uh, sorry, after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, obviously then you have this massive explosion, now suddenly Stalin's kind of the plucky underdog hero. And, and, it, and it, I mean, what's amazing is after the invasion, they don't have to spy anymore. That's one of the big right. themes of the book about Lendlease is that, you know, it goes from purchases, which are are under strict control because of various regulations, um, including the Neutrality Acts, to then the Soviets are getting aid uh, in the form Mm -hmm. of Lendlease loans, 
And then they're simply requisitioning whatever they need and whatever they like. And they're actually given the, the equivalent of kind of U.S. Army requisition forms. So what, what had previously been spies and aviation firms are now just kind of registered purchasing agents of the Soviet government that get to go around and just requisition pretty much whatever they want in order. They don't get everything they want, but I mean, they can right. just, we want this, 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 and that. They don't even really have to spy anymore. I mean, it is, it's quite extraordinary. And yeah, you talk about the highest levels of the government. I mean, there's obviously a lot of controversy around Alger Hiss, the State Department. Uh, Harry Dexter mm -hmm. White is now generally accepted by, I think, nearly all historians to have, uh, we know that he met Soviet handlers, that he was. But again, in his case, this is more of a volunteer. It's not that they're being kind of paid or, or um, importuned necessarily. It's that they voluntarily choose to help the Soviets. Harry Hopkins is another case where effectively Roosevelt's right-hand man who's running the entire Lend-Lease program, I wouldn't call him an agent as such. That is to say, he doesn't have a Soviet handler. But then why would he need one? Because he's there with Roosevelt at, at the summits. You know, he's there at places like Tehran and Yalta, effectively deciding policy at the table with Stalin, meeting personally with Stalin and meeting. So he didn't need a handler. I mean, he's working at a higher level. Um, you know, so that when I look at things like, uh, to some extent, some of the Soviet manipulations that helped to explain, uh, you know, Japan's moves leading up to Pearl Harbor, uh, draconian, draconian import controls, uh, the Treasury Department or the Treasury Department intervening and kind of cutting off Chiang Kai-shek while making sure that Stalin got everything that he needed. You know, some of that is sure you could attribute some of the acts of Soviet agents. But I think more than that, it was kind of just this larger climate of opinion where the Soviet Union had turned into this kind of you know, plucky ally, uh, nation of, of heroes and you know, sacrificing everything against Hitler uh, who were just deserving of all of this support. Um, and, you know, so the U.S. turns a blind eye, for example, to the fact that uh, the Soviets are actually arresting U.S. pilots who crash land on Soviet territory after bailing out over Japan or cut in forced massacre. They just hush all this stuff up, you know, to buff and burnish Stalin's image. It all just gets whitewashed. After Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, were the were the Soviets and we should explain that so Molotov was the uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs for for Stalin. Were they the ones commissar. who were leading the yeah. commissar? Oh, it was a commissar. Okay. So w were they leading the charm offensive and trying to recruit the Americans and the British on their side, or were the American or were Churchill and FDR seeing that as opportunity to bring Stalin on their side? Who was leading that? And then did FDR and Churchill's ever reevaluate the relationship they had with the Soviet Union and see them as, you know, a, a evil force, whereas before they saw them as maybe not so much of a threatening force? Did, that ever, did their minds ever change afterwards? Uh, yeah, you definitely have to differentiate between Roosevelt and Churchill. Uh, you know, first okay. of all, of course, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, the United States is still neutral in the war. So there was no real mm -hmm. compelling reason really why to side with the Soviet Union and unleash this lend lease largesse, which he does largely kind of just on his own. Um, you know, and yes, maybe the argument, the same one Churchill would have made, even though the U.S. wasn't in the war yet, he thought the U.S. would eventually be in the war. And effectively, it was better for the Russians to do the kind of fighting, bleeding, and dying than for the U.S. and Britain. So that, that's their argument, right? It's like, mm -hmm. we need to give Stalin everything he wants and needs and desires to stay in the war against the Germans to kind of tie down German forces to save American or, or British lives. It makes a lot more sense in the British case, because Britain had already been at war, of course, for, for two years against Nazi Germany. Let's I mean, Hitler were allies. In the case of the United States, at the time still neutral before Pearl Harbor, you know, it's a harder case to make, and that's why they actually keep it secret for about six months. They don't own up to what they're doing, and they actually give orders to diplomats to kind of keep their mouths shut about what's actually going on. Um, now, later on, no, I think Roosevelt, far from reevaluating, which, which, again, all strategic logic suggests they should have after 1942, or the, the latest maybe after summer 43, with the repulsion of the last German offensive at Kursk, you know, whether earlier, perhaps Stalingrad, uh, the winter of 42, 43, when the Soviets were no longer obviously as desperate to stay in the war. And it was pretty clear that they were going to survive. The U.S. could have perhaps curtailed the aid or perhaps applied more conditions to it regarding behavior, negotiating the post-war boundary of Eastern Europe. And instead, Roosevelt goes the other direction, of course, applies no conditions whatsoever, ratchets up the aid. I sometimes call, I don't know if people are, uh, remember the movie Spaceballs. I think they went from, what was it? They went from hyperspeed to ludicrous speed. You know, that's what happens with Lenin Stalin after 1943. There's no real strategic logic, whereas Churchill goes the other direction. You know, both at Tehran and Yalta, where he, he, he negotiates a much harder line or tries to with Stalin regarding things like strategic priorities, uh, Poland in the terms of accepting 
real elections in Poland, matters like that, whereas Roosevelt puts up almost no fight. Reverend Churchill also quietly begins doing things like uh, not sending as much aluminium or processed aluminum uh, to Stalin because it's it's desperately needed in Britain's own aircraft factories. It's just he feels Britain's power leaching away, and so he does become a little bit uh, more hard-nosed and tougher-minded, particularly from 1943 onwards. But he gets no support from Roosevelt. So, you know, in the end, he's just kind of forced by American pressure and, and leverage uh, to, to go along and kind of succumb to all the various concessions that Roosevelt makes at Tehran and the Alta vis-a-vis Soviet interests. Yeah, so one of the fascinating things I learned about your book was Churchill had this naivete with uh, in regard to the Soviets, whereas he was the first person on the major stage, uh, you know, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon sphere, to really see Hitler for the threat he was. He underestimated Stalin, and then it seems like he then starts to reevaluate sort of near the end. And then once, once the war is over, would you say that Truman and Churchill, who, who later comes back for prime minister again, that do, do you think that their opinion of the Soviet Union was different vis-a-vis where it was during World War II and where FDR's was, his opinion of the Soviet oh, Union? Oh, well, in terms of Churchill's opinion, I mean, he goes violently in the other direction. He actually proposes hmm. going to war with the Soviet Union to win a square right. deal for Poland at the end of the war. He, right. he, he road tests the, his famous Iron Curtain phrase even before the, hmm. the speech at Fulton, Missouri in March 46. He road tests that phrase as early as, I think, May 12, 1945. Truman was certainly tougher than Roosevelt had been vis-a-vis Stalin, but again, it doesn't happen all at once. You know, he keeps Hopkins in house. He sends Hopkins to Stalin to negotiate in late May 45, even after the fall of Nazi Germany, even after VE Day. Um, He does begin to toughen up uh, right at the end of the war with Japan. And I mean, it's a huge story and I don't really have time to do it justice, but uh, there's even an argument that by dropping the atomic bombs, Truman was trying to kind of muscle Stalin out of Asia. If, if so, I mean, he had kind of outsmarted himself because he kept pushing for the Soviets to enter the war and he kept encouraging and in fact, green lighting massive amounts of lend lease aid being sent to Vladivostok, where in the end, the Soviets were able mm. to kind of invade Manchuria, North China, Sakhalin and Korea largely with uh, American equipment and certainly fuel and gasoline, along with uniforms and foodstuffs, which had been sent essentially free of charge by the United States across the Pacific Ocean. And they're still sending this right up to August 1945. So, you know, if Truman was hoping to keep the Soviets out of northern Asia, it was a rather a strange way to do it. Um, uh, Although in the end, the Soviets had to rush their own timetable, um, you know, basically bumping up their own invasion timetable by two weeks so that they would not miss out on the opportunity of carving out territory at the expense of Japan. You know, that is to say, they, they got into war on August 9th, the same date of the dropping of the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki, specifically so that they would not be deprived of an Asian empire. Huh. Um, and of course, this had tremendous knock-on consequences, not least in the future of the Chinese civil war and the onset of Maoist communist rule in China. Right, right. We're dealing with today. What's your biggest takeaways from a U.S. foreign policy perspective? This is my last question for you. So what, what would be your biggest takeaways that we could gleam out of this era from a U.S. foreign policy perspective today? I know that's kind of a really broad question, but there must be things that you think that are overlooked narratives that that we can glean from the World War II era. What would you say they were? Oh, it is a very broad question. I mean, I have to single out maybe just a couple of kind of almost case studies. Um, You know, one of which is the somewhat shocking American abandonment of Chiang Kai-shek in China. Um, There are parallels to Churchill's abandonment of Mikhailovich and the Chetniks in Yugoslavia, where he ends up favoring uh, Tito and the partisans instead. This almost self-sabotage that uh, it seems to recur again and again in U.S. foreign policy in the 20th century, that is the U.S. embracing a kind of a client or a cause and then abandoning that client. You know, you saw that with Chiang Kai-shek in China. It was completely cut off after 46. And effectively, they ruled out serious aid to him all the way back in 43 and 44. And can you can you just give us a brief over oh, who's Chiang Kai-shek for the viewers? A lot of people don't know who that is. Okay, so effectively, we call it the Kuomintang or the Chinese kind of nationalist forces who are also just as in Yugoslavia with Mihailovich and the Chetniks facing Tito and the partisans. That is, there's communist side too, you know, under mm-hmm. Mao and his forces. On. So that uh, Chiang Kai-shek is doing all of the fighting against Japan and somehow Roosevelt was allowed to, he let himself be convinced that it wasn't really true and that Mao was doing a lot of the fighting true. In fact, Stalin had broken an agreement where Japan was not going to b- bother Mao's forces and vice versa. So that Mao just gets yeah. to husband all of his strength during the war as Chiang Kai-shek is sort of battering himself against Japan, holding down 80 Japanese divisions and getting nothing for it. He doesn't even get invited 
to the big three conferences. Wow. Um, and, and in the end, although temporarily he, he benefits from the victory over Japan in 1945, um, the U.S. cuts him off, even as Mao links up with the Soviet Far Eastern armies, and they share arms with him and intelligence, and eventually they're able to ship him whatever he needs. And so effectively, you then have a civil war in which the Soviets are actively supporting one side, and the U.S. is abandoning its own side, uh, which explains fairly neatly. <laughs> there are a lot of other arguments about morale, and maybe Mao was more popular in the countryside, and Chiang Kai-shek wasn't really running a tight ship. There are all kinds of critiques you can make, but basically mm -hmm. the upshot is that the U.S. Abandon, abandons its clients and Stalin supports Mao and Mao wins the civil war. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are further cases. The U.S. effectively abandoned Batista in Cuba shortly before the Castro takeover. Mm -hmm. It abandons Go Jin Jim in Vietnam. I mean, it's a very strange pattern. I mean, I suppose one might say there's a fickleness in U.S. foreign policy where sometimes we embrace these clients who turn out to be perhaps not angels. And so then the kind of the American puritanical streak comes in and, oh, but Chiang Kai-shek, his hands aren't clean and there's corruption and we don't want to support him. And maybe if we didn't want to support him in the first place, that'd be one thing. But of course, he had come to rely on USA. And so, you know, if, if you get involved in a conflict like that, you know, I think it, it doesn't speak well of you to abandon your clients. So there's <laughs> we we have a lot of cases of the U.S. doing that over the past yep. eight years, yep. and it's a it's 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 not exactly a a salutary history. Professor McMeekin, thank you so much. The book is called Stalin's War. Appreciate you coming on this fascinating discussion. Okay, thanks for having me, Ashton. If you enjoyed our show, please click subscribe to stay up to date with our YouTube channel and podcast, and give us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts so that we can keep delivering guys some great content. Thanks for listening, and we will be back next week. We're going to talk about the issues that really matter our country, our economy, the Fed, QE, GDP, BTC, NFTs, AOC, the CCP, Cardi B, Ow. Yeezy, Yellow Socks, Iran, Joe Biden's dementia, Come on, man. and probably sex robots. We stand for a free and open debate and exchange of ideas. And if you disagree with anything we talk about, you are a racist and no better than Hitler. What? Let's get started.